my biggest piece of advice is like, don't give anything away until they show you the value. <laughs> I've seen it all the time in early stage. Oh, this person's gonna help me raise money. They're gonna help me do X, Y, and Z. Well, that. Like, make sure they show you that they're actually gonna deliver that and then compensate them after the fact. That's my biggest piece of advice. Is people are so hungry for help. Your equity is gold. Mm. It really, really, really is. So treat it like gold and let people earn it. And at the same time, though, like there are people that will earn it and they're probably worth their weight. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Our guest today was hustling for a fast growing SaaS software company when she was sidelined by a severe lower back injury that led her to search for workouts that were low impact yet super effective. This concept led her to find the most underused machine in the gym, the rowing machine. With this in mind, she founded City Row, the only true omni-channel approach to smart fitness. What started as one studio on the 15th floor of an office building in New York is now a chain with over 11 studios and 60 in development. In this week's episode, we cover several topics, including how to make the decision to franchise a business and how to find the right partner, deciding between creating an app versus creating a bricks and mortar business, and how a boutique studio goes about building a direct-to-consumer connected fitness product. So please welcome the founder and CEO of City Row and City Row Go, Helene Knapp. So Helene, thanks for joining me today. We Just before we started, you were talking about badass women. And as I research you, I, I have to admit that you are a badass woman. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I, I was very impressed at sort of relatively a young age um, when I relate that to my age but you've you know you've 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 achieved a lot and so what I wanted to do today is just to sort of talk through how you did that um because it, you know a lot of the stuff you did would just be way over my head and um so yeah I, th I thought maybe we could we could kind of start a little bit um and I, I'll, I'll probably not jump in at, at the very beginning but I, I wanted to talk about your first studio and, um, and forgive me if some of the dates are not perfectly right, but I, I went online and used a lot of the press releases that went out there. So from, from what I've seen online, your, your first studio was about 2014. Is that, is that correct? Spot on that. Good, good start. So, so first studio, and I, I know there's a lot of people that are kind of thinking about opening studios or franchising. And, and I, I thought an interesting place to start was, was the kind of what went through your mind in terms of, why did you want to, I, I, yeah, and, and I'll, I'll come on to the, sto the story, you know I, know, I know you had some sort of personal challenges that got you to open the studio, but, but once you made that decision that you felt you wanted, a, you wanted to open a studio, how did you go about um, deciding what the product was going to specifically be and, and deciding, you know, where you were going to open and, and how you were going to put all the parts together to actually get a physical location in place because it's a huge you know from from an idea to opening there's a there's a lot of key steps and and it's overwhelming even for someone that's that's been in business for a long time and done it so t talk me through you know the idea where did you start and what were some of the key steps that you needed to get in place to get that first location opened yeah great question matt well i'll reiterate thank you again for having me i'm excited to be here and hopefully people can learn a couple things maybe from some of my mistakes from your own um it's a great question and I'll I'll answer it with a very early piece of advice that I got, which really was the guiding light for me in those early days. And sometimes I still go back to, which is just keep making one decision at a time to move the company forward, right? So this is, people always ask me like, what was the moment that you knew? There was never a moment that I knew, Matt. Um, it was more that I just kept making little decisions forward. And then all of a sudden we had a studio open. And so the first decision as you mentioned, came because I really had the idea for this concept because I had an injury. And the idea for the concept was I want to introduce something new to the market that's going to check the boxes of delivering a great workout and having it be really effective. But I wanted this other layer that I wasn't able to find, which was I wanted something that was also really safe and smartly designed for my body as a workout. Meaning, meaning there's a million ways to work out that were hard. Give me a hundred burpees. There was nothing out there that I could find that was going to not only be fun and sexy and cool, but that also is going to be intelligently designed for most bodies that are not an athlete. And so that was the concept. And I was a hundred percent in on the concept day one. And then the question to your point was, okay, how do I take this idea and bring it into reality? And 
step one for me was kind of refining the concept. So I knew I wanted low impact. I wanted a hip workout. I had, I, I started to get introduced to rowing. I actually thought rowing was kind of ugly. I had no experience with rowing, never rode a day in my life, mad. But I saw it as a piece of this puzzle that I was trying to solve, which was high intensity, low impact. And so my first problem that I had to solve was how do I redefine rowing and how do I give it a makeover? And so that was the first step, right? I had to refine the concept before I even thought about signing a lease. And so I found this beautiful article in Details Magazine featuring a rower. It was actually the water rower. That was one of those light bulb moments. I was like, holy shit, that's beautiful. It's sold at the MoMA. I kind of want to touch it. If I've got to make rowing sexy and cool, okay, first first problem solved, decision made. I'm going to use that machine. Step two, rowing really hard. Don't want to do it for an hour. Cool. Okay. What are we going to do in between? Right. Okay. Let's do a lot of body weight exercises. Let's still keep it low impact. Let's bring on someone that can intelligently design something. Okay. I'm feeling pretty good about the concept. Okay. Step three, how do we assess demand? Ooh, that was a big one. Mm. How do I know people are going to want this if I spent a lot of money on it? Ooh, I'm scared. Right. I had a huge career in tech and I was doing quite well. My dad for the first time was like, wow, great. You know, one of the kids off the payroll, good to go. So I really wanted to make sure that we were going to have enough client demand for this. And so I had a couple ideas were circling. Do we just throw up a pop-up, see who comes? I didn't think that I could actually activate a pop-up. And so we threw up a website, sign up here for the next big thing, collected email addresses. We got a critical mass really quickly, which gave me confidence to start going. So assessing demand was actually really important. And I'm really glad that we took that time and that step. Then it was, okay, execution. How do we do this? Everything from learning what an operating agreement was to putting the first capital in to getting the big book of checks, which was like the coolest moment when you get those big checks. I don't even think you need them anymore. But for me, like the big checks, Matt, were a moment. That was a moment in the what happens next. And then, you know, your first couple of setbacks that you have to power through, which I think are important for everyone because they're just a little bit of a peek into the future of what's going to happen. For me, it was that our trademark name wasn't going to work. I've been written up in the press. I had the big checks for the for the name Row NYC. Turns out there was some competition there. So we had to change our <laughs> name in the middle of everything. Almost lost it. That almost broke it. And then it was, okay, to your question, where are we going to open? To me, there was never a question. It was always going to be in the heart of New York City in Union Square. There was no question for me that's where the people were. That was the most transient area. I knew we'd capture the most amount of people. And for our first flagship, it had to be there. Now, what I ended up finding was the 15th floor of an office building <laughs> in Union Square because we were so young and so scrappy. So it was really one tiny decision at a time that laddered up to a thousand decisions that ultimately made the one big. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah. With the finance side, so I, I guess it was, you know, opening in New York City is a, is a big commitment. You've got to put a name on a leash. You've got to raise money. You've probably got to get cash flow to keep you going as you're gen generating sales until you're able to pay that back. So was that something that you had money yourself or did you have to go to someone and convince them that this is a great idea? Do you want to invest in in me? Yeah, do you want to join the Helene train? <laughs> yeah. So that was the route that I had to go. I was not able to, you know, bootstrap this myself. I was able to be a participant, but I was pretty young at the time and I knew that I needed some capital to not only build it out, but also sustain it and fund it. And so I did, and that was probably the hardest part for me. I really hated asking people for money, <laughs> even though you have to flip it on your head and you're like, wow, you're giving people an opportunity to be along for the ride. Right. And those early people now I'm kind of like, you know, you got in pretty, pretty sweet guys, including my grandma, you know, which I'm happy <laughs> to have her on the cap table, but you have to really flip it around and that comes from confidence. And I was, I was really young. So I was still working through that, but I did have to ask people and you start with your friends and family. And I'm really fortunate that I had a lot of friends um, and family and also all my former bosses, right? In the beginning, people are likely betting on the jockey. That's why mm -hmm. I joke about the Helene train. One of our early investors was like, I don't know about this rowing thing, but I'm on the Helene train. I had another investor who came to an early class and she asked me, do I need to wear a bathing suit? And I said, Pam, like, what, what do you think this is? 
And she's like, I thought we were having like little pools. And I was like, so you wrote me a check and you didn't even read the deck. <laughs> and so I think um, in retrospect, like now I know people were betting on the jockey early days and you have to also bet on yourself. Hmm. With with the raising of capital, so outside your friends and family, which which I guess is a sim, you know, I've got, I work with my family. So I guess it's a slightly different conversation than someone that's putting in, you know, that you don't know that's probably putting in money and they could risk losing it. And, and you need to sort of show them why they should do it. When you, when you created it for your non-family people, um, how important was it to get the, the deck put together and the numbers and, 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 um, and, and, and did you have to get some help to, to sort of put together a, a business plan that was actually, um, made sense and you could actually deliver upon. Matt, I want to tell you that I spent time on a deck and a model. I did not in the beginning. I really, I really didn't. There was maybe a one sheeter or an email, but <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good story because it was literally a hope and a prayer. And I was also already doing it. Like, I think I talk about this a lot. You have to have a certain amount of like naivete to actually do this right you, you can't know everything otherwise it's like you're jumping into waters that are that's full of crazy creatures like you can't know what the crazy creatures are you just have to have confidence that you're going to be able to fend them off and actually navigate those really really dangerous waters and so that's how i entered it i did not have a deck day one so we opened our first location and did that first funding round really just on the concept and on conversation wow. and we were really scrappy with it. I didn't raise millions of dollars. It was, it was a couple hundred thousand. So it was a different mm -hmm. game. Then, you know, my co-founder, Ashley joined. She is also a yin yang, right? You bring people on board that are complementary skill sets to you. She was like, well, obviously we need a deck. And she was able to whip up a deck. And so for future, for future fundraising rounds, I like to think that we had a really strong deck with a vision of not only what we were to do in the next, you know, six, nine, 12 months of that capital, but ultimately where we were going with it, both financially and also from an execution. So it sounds as though you kind of bootstrap, you didn't raise a ton of money. And it certainly, my guess is with the New York City rents, you, the pressure was on once you opened your doors to get people in and start generating cash quite quickly. Um, how did how did that go? You know, was it did it go as planned? I, I've, I've done a bunch of similar things. Even when I was a kid, I, I, I used to run parties in nightclubs and you used to think you're going to have a couple of thousand people in and then you'd have like three or four hundred and it was like, OK, you know, that the, the most difficult thing for most people is getting bums on seats and generating income. So what was that? Were you were, were you in a did it go well or, or was that pretty tough going as well? Early days in Studio One, it was it worked pretty well. I mean, especially in retrospect, we did not spend a dollar on marketing. We, wow. in retrospect, we hit the market at the right time. We crushed PR. We crushed PR yeah. to the point that we had, again, 1,500 people signed up for this thing before we even opened our doors. And we we actually nurtured press really well. It was also the perfect time in the market. This is this is like pre-class pass. This is true boutiques. And so mm -hmm. there truly was not enough supply for the demand. Right. So we also like you have to understand where the market is and where supply and demand is. We were we hit at the perfect point. We at, on the flip side, though, we did not learn early on how to market the business because we were always in, we were in the right place at the right time. And that actually bit us in the in the in the ass for number two, because we we're like, <laughs> oh, well, if we build it, they will come. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so a lot that of false lessons confidence. learned, but that first location <laughs> was um hit the market at the right time. We had janky elevators. We had a shared bathroom on the floor with people that hated us. We had like lawsuits with the music, but the customers came, they loved it. They came back and they felt in their bodies our mission. And so that was all the fuel we needed to one, keep going, reinvest in the business, make improvements, and also think about how we were gonna grow it. Um, but never really refined the marketing chops in that first studio um, because, you know, we we kind of hit the market at the right time and we had this PR arm that was really flexing. Mm. So second location, I believe around about 2016, um, you'd obviously come off success. So I guess you, I, I've, I've been there as well. I guess you kind of have this little bit of confidence, oh, you know, 
world's my oyster kind of thing. I, I don't know whether that was your case, no, but yeah. how did you go into number number two then? And, and what were some of the differences between that first and studio and the second one then? Made all the mistakes in number two. You know, people <laughs> always say the first pancake is when you really learn stuff. No, for us, it was the second pancake because the first one wasn't a pancake. It was just a little microwave. Let's see what happens. Um, it was a replication, essentially. So for number two, we signed a fancy retail spot, ground floor. We hired the architect behind dry bar because I was like, I want this to be the visual <laughs> representation that we didn't do last time. We spent more money than we had. We had a $50,000 floor. Like we made all the mistakes. I cut a, a 35 square foot hole in the side of a building. I learned everything there was to learn about a louver. I don't know what that is either. <laughs> yeah, it's basically an exhaust window that like this studio didn't have. And I was told the 11th hour, we didn't have approval to cut that hole in the wall. But I also was being told by our contractor, we didn't cut the hole we weren't opening in two weeks. And so I had to like, I don't know if I broke laws, but like I had to do some crazy shit to get that studio open. And amidst it all, we did not market. Like we did not have a budget for marketing. We didn't know. I think we did some subway ads because that sounded cool. Um, but we did not market it. And, you know, it really had some early success. We also then had like a pretty devastating flood six weeks in, which took out our studio that was just on the up and up. And so with that one, we learned, we learned a lot of hard lessons that I like to think hopefully inform some of the future studios. But mm. number two, we, we learned a lot of lessons. Mm. So with marketing and I was at the boutique uh, studio fitness event last week and um, I met the ladies from Fitting Room who were kind of telling me they opened, don't, don't, I can't remember exactly what year, but probably early on similar to yourself and there was only a few studios in New York. Now she gave me the numbers of how many were actually open and, and uh, the, the penetration is about the same, but the amount of studios is, is, is huge now. So I guess you have to be really on the ball with your you know, the costs that you're spending to acquire a client and then to be able to retain them. So what, what were some of the things that you shifted in terms of getting bums on seats for that second location or things that you found to be quite effective? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, I feel fortunate in that, you know, we're talking 2016. And so we were able to spin up some digital ads. We were able to bring on some partners to help us just drive leads. And then kind of tracking the main KPIs along the, the customer journey to being a member, we started to really understand where we were succeeding, where we weren't in that, okay, we were able to drive people in, but they really, we learned that they had to come three times because of our modality. It's brand new. It's different. People grew up running and riding bikes. Most people have never rode before, let alone understanding our modality, which is a hit class with rowing. And so we learned that, you know, it can be X amount of dollars to drive a lead into the studio, but then we have to figure out how to get them in three times. And so a lot of testing around different intro offers depending on the market, we're probably still testing intro offers because we got to get them in three times. Uh, and then once they're in three times, we have a pretty healthy conversion rate to a member. And then our retention rate is really great. But we have we have more challenges up front is kind of what we learned throughout this process. Um, and it's all about building community, right? Community is what we're doing here in, in fitness studios. Like they're, That's why people are going to come in versus doing something at home or on their own. They want that motivation, that accountability, the energy and the fire of people around them. And so I think the most successful studios that we have have not only cultivated a really good early adopter group, but then nurtured them to really bring their friends in and welcome in those new leads and really help grow the studio organically through community. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the Escape Barrow a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, this training tool is easy to use, safe for all, and pretty darn stylish. The Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged, and carried, making it one of the most versatile strength and conditioning tools on the market. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. When you'd open your second studio then from a 
cash perspective, did you have to um, rethink at the way at the way you were funding the business, or did you did you go back to the existing people, or did you have to find new people? And was there any more challenges in terms of your investors with with you know how long it, it took to sort of you know from a marketing perspective to get people in? Yes. When I said I made all the mistakes with number two, funding is definitely also in that bucket. Yes, I went to the existing investors. Some of them participated. Then it was really around networking and just trying to get to new people who could be potential investors. And this is like we're, we're still in angels, friends and family round now. And so it's really friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, friends of investors. You know, I come from the tech startup world. And so I knew a lot of people that were investing in tech. And it, for me, the challenge was how do I find people that understand retail? And so oftentimes it was actually passionate people. And we actually brought on board some clients. So some really passionate City Row clients ended up joining, which is really fun and really cool to know that these people feel it and they're going to bet behind it. Um, but we set out to raise 750 and I think we got 400K. So we ended up like not having enough money, having to get a loan with our contractor. Like when I say all the mistakes, Matt, I mean all the mistakes. And so that that second round of funding was really, really challenging and hard um, for, for a ton of reasons, because at the same time too, we still hadn't proven out number two yet. And so once we were building it, we were still fundraising uh, and it was it was quite the journey. Yeah, I, I, I bet. In terms of the people around you, uh, and I've, I've listened to a number of your podcasts, you've, you've done a lot of great interviews and um, it, it sounds as though you kind of built a team around you to complement your skills. It, it, you know, you've got a gym, you've got a facility, studio opening, you're dealing with contractors, you're figuring out the program. And you're dealing with investors that probably in some cases are kind of wanting to check in to see how you're doing on a regular basis. Where did you focus your energy and what were some of the probably two or three really important people that you felt you needed to get around you so that you could turn your back and know that somebody was was looking after the other stuff whilst you were doing other things? Yeah, I mean, that person has changed every couple of months at the company. <laughs> It, no, frankly, it's like in, in early days, I needed to find the person that was going to teach the classes, right? That's Annie. She came on board, you know, as a founding member, as a founding instructor and, you know, had a programming and she still wears that, that VP hat today. Then it was, okay, well then I'm going to manage the studio. And then after a couple of months, we're like, okay, we're going to expand. Who's going to manage the studio so I can go work on the business, not in the business. And then as we progressed, it was like, wow, I'm really good at business development. I'm good at, you know, building community. I'm good at hiring, but I, I need to, I'm not a finance person. I need to bring someone in that can do some of this finance and legal. So then I brought in someone to do that. And then as we continue to grow, okay, we're gonna do this technology thing. We can only be with an agency for so far. I got to bring in a tech lead. And then it's like, wow, this company is growing really fast. I think my biggest, the biggest ability that I have to be able to backfill we're talking about here is I'm very self-aware. I'm, I, I don't have an ego here. Like I don't need to, need to be the person to solve every problem. I know where to put myself in, right? My co-founder is very good at being like, Helene, go figure that out. Don't come back until you have a solution, but I'm not like that on every problem. And so at every point we've been bringing that person in, same thing with our recent chief strategy officer that we brought in, right? So at every point in the business, that backfill has been really important. And then in, in addition to that, I need to have a bench of people that are literal ninjas in certain fields. And day one, that was a contractor. And this mm. contractor ended up being a huge investor and really good friend and mentor. I had to call him, do I cut the hole in the wall? Like, what do I do with the, leave, the louver? You yeah. know, so in the beginning, it was very different. It's morphed into now I have a really great HR advisor that I can talk through people challenges with, which early days, we were just all happy to be there, right? And so it's really evolved over time. I have really close confidant on the fundraising side, talking about fundraising strategies. His name's Chad, he's been around for a long time. And then I, I have some great female mentors in my life that I can be really open with and honest with about, you know, confidence challenges or, you know, again, people challenges, growth challenges. Uh, and it's just about having a bench of people with complementary skill sets that you can call on and then again, not be afraid to call and ask for help. Right. Now, I understand that in 2017, you partnered up with companies. Is it, is it Franworth? Is that how yep. you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. um, decided to go down the franchise route. This is all pre-pandemic um, and um, yeah, quite an impressive list of brands that they represent. So 
what caused you to to make the decision to say, okay, look, we've got we've got a couple of studios going. Um, we now want to, you know, take this concept out. Why um, why did you choose to go down the franchise route? And then how did you go about the process of finding the right partner that could navigate you through what was going to be required to sort of scale this to hundreds of locations? I did not want to franchise the business at all. I knew nothing about it though. And before we made a decision to lean in like intentionally into driving corporate growth or franchise growth, I thought I owed it to myself and the company to learn a little bit more about franchising. And the more I dug in, the more I was like, a couple things. One, like, I don't know if this is for my fancy New York City brand. So I was a little bit worried about that. But I also was really, really intrigued by how capital efficient it was for the macro company. And I hated fundraising, but also I knew we had to dedicate a ton of resources to, you know, a growing digital side of the business. So I wasn't sure I could raise, you know, three X the amount of capital to do the same amount of um, corporate locations. So I thought that there were some really appealing pieces to it. And then once I ultimately met Fran Worth, who I didn't even want to take the first call with them, but you know, we're all Michigan grads. And so you take the first call with your alumni. And um, I learned from them that, man, what a powerful relationship it is. And I saw this great opportunity to give people a chance to build wealth and to live a lifestyle doing something they love. I love wearing leggings every day and being able to jump into a class and kind of morph this love that I had for taking care of myself and wellness with also being a badass professional. And so I actually got excited about thinking about who could actually take the keys of this thing and change their lives. And so that's what really got me over the fence. And it was that plus Franworth and their proven track record and being able to build out the back end systems to complement our branding and programming and marketing. And so we were a really good partnership fit. So it was the, I knew they could figure out the things that you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> That's why we partnered with them. This was a yeah. really big risk, but I trusted them. And I was, I was pretty intrigued by the model. When, for someone who's looking to find that partner, maybe they've got one or two locations and they're, they're saying, okay, this is for me. Are there any things that you've learned now that are important to look for in a partner that's going to take you through that? Like, you know, maybe it's not Franworth, but if they, if they were looking for them, you know, are there some key things that like, you know, you definitely need this in a, in a franchise partner or advisor? Yeah. I mean, it really depends on what you're good at and what you need help with. I think Franchising in general is a really, really, really great model, and it can be extremely lucrative for all parties. I think my biggest piece of advice is not to rush into it, is to do a lot more corporate stores than you ever thought possible, because you have to perfect the model many times over, and you have to try it in a lot of different markets. We tried it in a couple. I wish we'd done 25 more. Um, I'm not sure that we could have. And I'm like, you know, everything happens for a reason. Um, and we learned a ton from our early franchises, franchisees as a result of it. We also, we hit COVID early on, which was really poor timing for the early days of our, of our business. But I would say, again, kind of back to that, who do you surround yourself with? Make sure you have a really good understanding of what you're good at and where you need help. But if you know how to open, spin up, market, drive butts and seats, then potentially what you really need from a franchising partner is help me with the legal back of office, right? That's what I would, what I would say is like when you're ready for franchising is when you're ready for someone to operationalize legal, operationalize royalty collection, operationalize a design and construction manual, and really process the back of the, back of the, of the house and to manage franchisees which is, by the way, a very different business. So once you figure it out, your four wall businesses many times over, then you likely find a partner that can kind of bring that operational expertise to the table and the franchise operations. I know lots of people that have been in, involved in similar situations. And one of the challenges that I find with most founders um, is as you go through this journey, like you did, you know, one to two, two to five, five to 10, and then bringing on franchise partners, et cetera, that your sort of piece of the pie starts to kind of diminish quite quickly. And, and you end up being a very minority person if, if you're not 
navigating it quite carefully. So how did you do that? You know, what, are there any sort of lessons that you've got? Did you get advice about, you know, how and when to cut up and, and give up, give equity and, and, and how to sort of do that in a way where you're actually um, staying, you know, relatively in control of your own personal destiny as opposed to being a, a sort of a, uh, an overworked employee. <laughs> yes. Well, I think we can all speak to maybe being an overworked employee at some at some point in our lives. Um, I think as long as you bring in the right people to the cap table, hopefully you're all you're all growing in the in the right direction. Of course, we made our, our, our many mistakes over the years, but I I kind of also believe this is also about going in eyes wide open. Like if you go in, you're like I have to be 100% owner, 80%, 60%. Like it just might not happen, and you might be setting yourself up for disappointment. And so. I think go in eyes wide open and know that having a small piece of a massive pie is way bigger than having a huge piece of a nothing pie. And that, again, that it's a really great way to think about how you value equity. Is this person going to make the pie bigger? And if so, how, right? So oftentimes, like when an investor comes in, I guess the typical, you know, model is that any big fundraising you do, you're going to, you know, give away 20% of the company at every point. Well, hey, if that capital is going to help you 5X, game over all day, every day. And so as long as you come into it with the right perspective, like you should want to give away equity to the right people that are going to make that meaningful of a difference in the business. And so that, that's my perspective on it. And um, I'm very happy with the position today. Um, but it, I think that you also really need to come at it with the right perspective. Mm. And is would you say a lot of the, the skill or the art in that is really making sure that when you are giving that 20% away or whatever it is, that you've really got to do the due diligence and making sure that, you know, that 20% is the person that's going to give you the five or 10 X as opposed to someone who will give you one to two, <laughs> which can easily happen as well, I guess. Yeah. And if you, you know, I think that people early on get very excited about the business, right? My co-founder is very good at like being like, claim. everybody wants to help. Okay. What are they going to do? And I get so excited, right? It's so hard to be an entrepreneur. It's so hard to be a founder. Like you want people to help you. So when someone's like, yeah, I can help it over here. I'm like, great. And I'm like, well, maybe I want to be an advisor. I want some equity shares. My biggest piece of advice is like, don't give anything away until they show you the value. <laughs> I've seen it all the time in early stage. Oh, this person's going to help me raise money. They're going to help me do X, Y, and Z. Well, that. Like make sure they show you that they're actually going to deliver that and then compensate them after the fact. That's my biggest piece of advice is people are so hungry for help. Your equity is gold. Mm. It really, really, really is. So treat it like gold and let people earn it. And at the same time though, like there are people that will earn it and they're probably worth their weight. Mm. Yeah, good, good advice. Now, 2018, this is, this is a bit that kind of impressed me because this is before the pandemic and, um, and you guys, and I wanna know, why you, you know, how you went through this thought process, but you decided to kick off with uh, City Road Go, which is a digital product. Um, so you're basically going into technically a very different business model. You, you, you're, you've gone from a bricks and mortar business where you're getting people in, running classes face to face, to a product which involves technology, a physical product which has got to be brought in, distributed, serviced, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you've got to sell it in a very different way as opposed to in New York, you're in New York and I guess there's a certain amount of passing trade where now you're starting to try and sell to people that you, you know, could live anywhere across the country. So why did you decide to do that before everybody else jumped on the bandwagon you know, and it was obvious to do, you, you got in very early. Why did you decide to do it? And then again, how did you go about trying to create a product that would allow you to differentiate what you're doing with, with everybody else in the market at the time? That's, that's all you want to know, Matt. Um, <laughs> we, I, I get this question often. And in, in retrospect, like it felt very natural for us to go into that path. I think because my, both my co-founder and I came from the tech world. So the idea of building an app and creating content was way easier than even than thinking about how do we accelerate our four-wall business. <laughs> and so I think that that's just happenstance of who we are and our backgrounds. And so it made us really, really, really well positioned to have the confidence to bet on that category early. We also knew that this was always going to be a big business. I never wanted to have a couple of studios. I always wanted to go big with it. And so 
I actually took a step back in 2016, 2017 and made some big decisions as the bit on the business, right? I had backfilled with someone to manage the studios and I was able to take a step back and say, where are we taking the company? Do I go raise money and we do corporate stores and we're the next little cycle of rowing? Do we explore franchising? And as part of that discovery, the early numbers at a Peloton just kind of kept whispering in my ear and they kept whispering at me through investors too. I have this one of my, the very first check into the business, serial entrepreneur, his name is Dan Reich, big mentor of mine. He was like, go do that, go do that. And in the beginning I was like, what are you talking about? We have this brick and mortar business, we're printing money. Like, what are you talking about? And then, you know, he started talking a little bit louder and I started seeing it as well. And I saw an opportunity for us to just actually create an MVP, right? So how do we crawl, walk, run there? An MVP, you know, minimal viable product. So how can we get something in there and just test it? I also, back to your fundraising question, always found it very hard to raise for a brick and mortar business. The second I started talking about technology and subscription revenue, doors were opened conversations started happening. And so you have to go with the flow to some degree and building an app and delivering our content was the easiest decision of all time. And unfortunately, I also knew we did not want to be in the hardware business, right? We're already in brick and mortar subscription software. And so we partnered with our longtime manufacturer and partner in building out the city Rogo max machine, the, both the first one, which launched later in 2018 and also the one that launched in 2020 and, you know, very fortunate that our manufacturer also saw an opportunity here and was our seed capital. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a pretty great, um, great spot to be in because, uh, I, I, yeah, I, getting involved in a product business and everything that's, that goes ar- around that and sourcing and quality. No, thanks. <laughs> So, so did that, and, and, and so you say they also invested in the business as well at the same time. So they were, I, I guess, you know, they had quite a bit of skin in the game, I suppose. They did. They were, they were a capital partner to get the first MVP of the app up and running. Uh, and they also knew that they were going to get the hardware sales alongside mm. us. And we built a really strong relationship over time. So, uh, so it all comes back to relationships, Matt, in that, you know, when I finally went to them with this crazy idea, they'd seen us execute in the market for a really long time. And we brought some complementary skill sets to the table that they didn't have. They're inherently like a B2B, you know, manufacturer. And we brought this really cool, sexy, direct-to-consumer business, lifestyle business, female-focused business into the ecosystem that brought so much awareness and press for a modality that they'd never seen before. And they also have always wanted to deliver a, more experiences and more options to their existing clients. And so there was a lot of synergy. And by the time we decided to you know, do a deal together, we kind of already had that knowledge about each other. So it was a little bit less scary, I like to think. Mm, yeah, great, great decision. How did you market that then to, you said on your second studio, you didn't quite have the marketing dialed in. What was it like now to start marketing direct to consumer? I know myself, it's very expensive to do that. Um, where, where did you start in order to sort of, to build that and, and, and how did that sort of whole thing evolve of, of letting more people know about what you're doing and why they should buy it? Cause it takes a little bit, as you say, people understand running and cycling, uh, hence Peloton, but I suppose rowing and then a rowing class, it, it may need a little bit more explanation. So how, how did that all come together? Well, it's a good thing I made that mistake with studio number two, cause at this point yeah. I had a, I had a, you know, paid marketing agency that we would then spin up for the digital. But we actually launched, talk about assessing demand and learning from your customers. We actually launched directly to start with just an iOS and an Android app. So we still are today, but we're actually very hardware agnostic. So you can take a city row class, you can stream your content alongside any rower globally. Actually, half of our subscriber base does not own our hardware. You have access to a concept too. You have access to a water art, any rower, anywhere. You can be a city row member and part of our community. And so we launched that way day one. And we launched into the community of people that already owned a water rower because we were partners with water. We want to take learnings before Mm. we invested in the larger machine. And so our first 800 clients were free because we had we were able to tap into own media channels of our partners. So really, really, really scrappy. 
at the same time, we're also building a website and doing some really great content and, and collateral and commercials to be able to actually go wide with, uh, with paid media across channels through our first agency partner. And so a combination of many factors, but always believe in like, where are your customers? Where's your lowest hanging fruit? It's getting more and more expensive now. Mm. So we're constantly thinking, what own media channels can we tap into? What like-minded partnerships can we tap into? And I am always down for a conversation or a chat with someone that we can share audiences with that make a lot of sense, that feel organic, uh, but that we can all have a win-win and not give our money over to Facebook. So what have you what do you find now? Because uh, it, it is becoming quite expensive on things like Facebook now, a lot of competition, particularly in fitness. So have, have you what what's your sort of go to one in that consumer side at the moment? Then is, is it is it just partnerships or are you still using the likes of Facebook, Instagram and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of brands have to have a presence there as much as possible. But our strategy this year is how do we diversify as much as possible and month over month reduce the percentage that we're, we're, we're spending in that space? Because it's just, it's really inefficient. And it's also just, you know, my second tech company, we talked a lot about who do you trust? People trust their friends and their, and their family and then complete strangers before they ever trust the brand. And so leading a lot more into influencers, bringing on board our first celebrities later this year, which we're very excited about that feel really aligned and on brand and authentic. And so we're trying to tap into partnerships that feel aligned um, as how we're going to grow the brand forward. When you look at your app, you're, you've come from that background. So my guess is it's, it's something that comes relatively naturally to you. But did, did you go into the, the technology and the content creation, trying to find some angles of where you could do something different than a lot of the fitness apps? Because I, I guess just in, you know, you've got the production of the, of the um, uh, workouts is one thing, you know, you can have a basic experience or an amazing one, depending on the equipment they use and how you deliver that. And then also you've got the functionality within the apps and how you engage. Peloton have obviously done a great job with the way that they compete and, and things like that. So so what, what about yours did you, if anything, decide that you were going to have as, as something unique to uh, City Row Go? We wanted to honor our in-person experience and try and match that gold standard as much as possible. So for us, it was how do we translate what people are getting out of a studio? And step one is like, you have to understand what you're translating that's resonating and creating value for people. And so for us, we know that our clients love the variety. They love how dynamic classes are and they love our ethos, right? We take a very different approach to fitness. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We're here for empowerment. We want you to do this so that you can go lead a great life. Like, again, we're not here to beat you down. We're here to build you up. And so for us, it's a lot in our personality and who we are and how we make people feel. And so the hero for us is the video. It is the content. We quickly learned that there was an opportunity to do a wide variety of class times. So 20, 30 minutes actually became really important for us as we were driving engagement. And then we were like, wow, people want to row more. We've only ever done this 50 minute hit class, now a 30 minute hit class, 20. They really want more rowing, why, right? But once they have a rower, they fall in love with it, they wanna do more. Hey, here's an opportunity for a distance class, an endurance class, a power row class. And so we started listening to the consumers and building out complementary um, class types, which also included mobility. People's hips get tight, right? People want to, we, we actually forced people to do some mobility and yoga. If we did challenges, it was like X amount of rowing classes, hit classes, strength class, but you got to do one mobility class if you want your badge. Um, and so we try and feed people broccoli, but put a lot of cheese on it. Right. And when you say badges, are you rewarding people for going through different levels to, to encourage retention? Absolutely, Matt. And there is no value to the badges just yet but you better believe they will email customer service if they have not gotten their silver badge. <laughs> Very good. Now, 2019, interesting year for all of us, pandemic. I, I, I read uh, that you'd planned on 30 locations that year. And I was, I was just interesting as a, as a business leader, you know, what, what was it like as you went through that year um, in terms of you as a, as a leader, owner, founder, sort of, you know, leading a, a team of people. So how did you go into that year? And then how did you, 
how did you, I don't like to use the word pivot because everyone uses it, but essentially how did you sort of, when that smacked you on the nose, how did you adjust both your business strategy uh, and then also your leadership strategy when some suddenly, particularly in New York, nobody could come into the city, you couldn't engage with people in the same way. How, how did you go about that 2019 experience? Whew. I like to forget about it, Matt. Um, <laughs> 2019 was actually a very challenging year for us in that we had a couple of really, really major financial setbacks, partners that were going to come in, didn't. So we ran into a lot of financial challenges in 2019. So I thought 2020 was our year, Matt. Um, we had opened seven franchises, franchises in the six months before COVID hit. So we were just starting to work out the kinks and drive up how many members they had before they opened. And um, man, was it a big, was, was it a big blow. I mean, there's just really no other word for it. We closed our, I remember Friday, Friday the 13th, I think of March in New York City being like, we're going to stay open. People need to work out for mental purposes. And then within 24 hours, like shut it down, shut it down quickly, you know, and all the studios closed within like four hours of each other on Sunday. First time we closed that studio in six years. And so it was honestly one of the most intense couple of weeks as we got our feet under us and PPP and, oh my God, what are we going to do? Also, holy crap, think of the opportunity that we have to leverage our infrastructure of digital and our infrastructure of creating content for digital. We had live classes going up on Instagram within less than 24 hours. And so as crazy and horrible and sad as you know, this wasn't devastating to much of the community. I remember feeling creative juices that I hadn't felt since the early days of City Row because all of a sudden it was the wild, wild west. And so I actually think that we navigated it incredibly well because we saw opportunity and we also knew that we were delivering value to people. And so it was horrible and I probably blocked out for a good chunk of it, but I also know that we had some fun with it as best we could. And we took our offerings to the market and we thought about how we can really bridge that to people that need it. Mm. What, what would you, you know, after going through that, uh, and, it, and it was you know, sort of two or three years realistically to where we are today, but who, how, how, do, you, who do you think you've become as an entrepreneur, leader? Um, and I'm only talking about from the business sense, we could, you know, it's probably a whole separate podcasts on the personal side, but who, who do you think, how do you, how have you changed and who are you now that you wasn't at the, at the beginning of 2019, would you say? Well, I probably have a lot more gray hair that, because we've really been through a lot. It's been really, really, really hard. We all faced more challenges in the past two years than, you know, many of us faced for the, for the years prior and the whole world changed. The demand changed, where consumers are playing changed. I think I learned how resilient we are and I am to be able to really just tackle anything that the world throws at us. You know, I think that it's, uh, you have to always come back to your why and like why you're here, why you're delivering what you're delivering. That's what gets me through every single wave and every challenge and every problem. And, you know, God knows they arise every 30 to 45 minutes. Um, but I think I've gained a lot of confidence. I think I had some before, but I think um, I bet on me all day long as the <laughs> captain of the ship because you want to bet on someone that, you know, anyone can drive a boat when it's beautiful, sunny waters, but you got you to drive a ship through a massive thunderstorm to see if you have it. And I think pre-COVID, I, 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 I probably just didn't have the confidence that I do now to, to drive this thing and to see through, see through the storm. So definitely... Confidence, a lot more confidence in Helene today than 2019. Did you have to do anything, work on yourself through that period? I know I, you know, when it came through, I was like you, it was, there was this bit of excitement where it was wild west. You could suddenly do all the stuff that you, nobody was looking at you and, and you had that kind of, you know, bit of a period where you didn't know how long it was going to go and, and you thought it was going to be a few months, but every, you know, all, all bets are off and, and you could really sort of get get your teeth into a few things, but then as it as it kind of continued, and we, it's like this is going to be around for a long time and could be indefinitely. Um, did did you you know that's that's when I guess the mental side of things um, 
it took a lot of work and and you you really had to be that sort of inspiration for people and and that sort of light at the end of a tunnel so were there things that you did whether it's from a fitness perspective from a whether you got coaching or the, you know your mental health that that you felt that you're going to have to prioritize this so when you turn up in a meeting or you're making decisions that you were the best version of yourself that you could be i tried to always be very authentic and vulnerable as a leader and early days that meant me being like yeah i'm afraid <laughs> like i had a tough day today like man i miss people so i think always have wanted to lead by being a real human being that's also dealing with a lot of the same stuff and just talking to people. Like I tried really hard to early days of being remote, like foster connection with everyone. The The team will still joke that like in the beginning, I was like, let's do daily standups. Like, I don't really, I'm not worried about what you're working on, but like, I am worried about your mental health. And it also was uplifting for me. And so we did happy hours. We had people teach you know, crazy things, just like teach us something fun that like has nothing to do with work. Someone taught us how to plunge a toilet. Someone taught us how to make sourdough, how to, you know, do a, you know, a headstand. So like, I, I actually led by what I needed, which was like, I needed some connection um, and I needed community and needed that through people. Um, also definitely have, you know, a whole team of therapists and coaches that have been calling on for years. I think all founders need that. And if you don't, I got a couple of recos, I'm happy to share, but like that's, that's, that's baseline, Matt. It, it, it takes a village to work through that. And then I also, you know, we had a lot of setbacks in the franchise side, you know, it couldn't have been worse timing for our, for our system could not have been worse timing. And I had a very, I still do a very deep emotional connection with, with a lot of our franchisees, especially the early ones. And that was probably the hardest part was seeing some of them have to close. No wrongdoing on their own, but what shitty timing, right? And mm -hmm. if there's one thing that we know that separated the studios that were likely going to succeed versus those that weren't was maturity, man, these were all babies. And so I had to really do a lot of work and how to separate the emotional side of this business from me um, just to be able to weather it because otherwise it would have been too, too uh, wearing on me. Mm. So 2021, you've obviously, you obviously came out of that pretty well. You managed to raise, I believe, 15 million. Is that right? Yep. 12 million. 12 million. Okay. 12 million. What, um, what was that like? Cause that's a, that's a big chunk of change as they say. Um, <laughs> how was, was that different from the first times and, and you know, what was the, uh, I suppose what, what hooked the investors on what you're doing? Because certainly anyone that's got a, uh, a bricks and mortar business. It's, it's certainly not what you would see as the best area to put your money in. You know, maybe the, the world's going to close down again. Um, so, so how did you how did you hook people to say, look, this is really a great thing to get involved in, and uh, you know, invest in me again, invest in the Helene train. <laughs> yeah, Matt, you said it earlier when you were like, I'm really impressed that you bet early on digital. Well, that finally came out to play in a really big way because. In the midst of COVID, we saw some crazy tailwinds that we hadn't seen in a very long time. Plus, we've been around for a long time. So this wasn't something that was whipped up in a garage overnight or thrown together with a camera in an existing studio. This was had real infrastructure and real power and real years of, of consumer data and insights. And so it was the perfect time in the market for us to raise that big institutional funding round. Couple that with actually finding the right people I was always about bringing the right people in. You asked a question about equity and when the right time is to give it up. I had many people wanting to write me a check over the years that said, hey, listen, this franchise side is awesome, but get rid of the, the digital thing and I'll put in five or 10 million. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, that's not what we're trying. That's, I don't understand. Right. And same thing. Many, many, many people being like, the digital thing is huge. You're early on it, but you got to get rid of the retail. And I'm like, but that's our experience. That's who we are. That's how we connect with people. And that's our heritage. And also that's how we're going to really drive efficiency in the long term. And so it was that coupled with finding the right investors, Jason and JW and, you know, everyone at, you know, GW Asset Management, plus, you know, Chad and Andy and everyone else, like we found the right people to come on board to do this in the way that was intentional and inflow and authentic to the brand. And so that's why we, that's why we did it. Um, and you know, every person that we add to the cap table is added value. What's next then? Uh, is it is it 
going to be? Is it, are we going to see a city bike, city box, city run? Are you, are you going to stay true to, to the row? What, what are some of the things that you're able to share about where you guys see yourself in the next sort of five years and, and beyond? Breaking news, Matt, we are not launching a bike. We are not launching a <laughs> treadmill. We, we are not launching any other piece of connected hardware. For us, it is still very early days. And I think, you know, talk to a lot of people in the space. Um, most in our space, obviously, we, we saw some recalibration was going to happen in the direct-to-consumer connected fitness space coming out of COVID. We saw that writing on the wall for, for a long time. We are still in early days of city row into the masses and also into at-home fitness as well as smart fitness. And so you're going to see us lean really heavily into partnerships, into B2B. You're also going to see us with a lot more education and awareness for our open application, our open system. Not enough people know yet that you can engage with City Row with any rower anywhere in the world. That's how we are going to grow in this next phase, right? We pulled forward a lot of demand for connected hardware. So when I think about the levers of our business that make sense now, it's all about matching consumer demand. Matching consumer consumers want experiences right now. And consumers are looking for ways to get the most out of what they already have, which is where our app comes into play. And so you'll see a lot more partnerships. Again, I mentioned some cool celebrities coming on board. And we're going to start telling the world why City Row is the workout that you need to incorporate at least once a week, right? Drive those joint credits. <laughs> How do you feel about, and, and well, obviously you do feel confident, but, but you know, what's... What's your thought process about what we're seeing at the moment in that connected home fitness market? Because you have got the, the sort of um, the, the Goliath of Peloton and there's, there's a number of different imitations from mirrors to steppers. There's, there's, a, there's a lot in that space. You, do you think it's hot at the moment and, and there's a bit of a correction, but in the long term, it's, it's going to still go up? Uh, how, how are you guys looking at that? And how do you make sense about what's actually going on at the moment, which is a little bit of a correction from the pandemic with everybody suddenly going back into the gyms and, and, and maybe the consumer bit cooling down slightly. You know, we've certainly seen that in our business from the equipment side that goes into that space. But, you know, how, how would you, you explain what you see? So I'll answer that by taking a step back and just looking at macro market trends. Overall fitness and wellness is continuing to grow like crazy. And there's a reason for it. It's because one, Americans are unhealthy, but also there's many people that have yet to start a fitness and wellness journey. You know, we talk a lot with people that are like-minded like us, and we're actually like really kind of the 1% in this, in this industry. I look at this as a fitness maturity curve or fitness maturity funnel. And the entire funnel is growing as fitness and wellness continues to grow because more and more people are getting off the couch and saying, I'm going to start walking twice a week. I'm going to join a planet fitness. I'm going to maybe at some point join in a city row or an orange theory, right? When you progress down your funnel to learn more about your body and movement and prioritizing it, whether that's prioritizing it from a time perspective or prioritizing it from a financial perspective. Yeah. I used to allocate $10 a month. Now it's four, 400, right? And People have spent a lot more than that per month on fitness and wellness across the board. And so connect, the entire pie is growing. The entire funnel is growing and has showing zero signs of slowing down. That's why we're all in this industry, right? Unlimited opportunity. Connected and digital fitness is at the bottom of that fitness maturity. It's at the point when you discover or decide that I'm going to prioritize this either to dedicate a space in my home, to pay for something financially or to figure out how I fit in these extra days, four, five, and six, right? Because getting going to the gym is actually like takes a lot of time. Mm. And so connected fitness is at the top of, or the bottom of that fitness maturity curve. And we pulled forward so much demand over the past two years. We reached up and we pulled forward anyone that was preparing to buy a piece of equipment in the next couple of years. <laughs> and so we're experiencing a recalibration. Whereas if the if, if this piece of the market was growing at let's call it seven percent year over year, I think it's a lot more than that. And then it grew to like 8,000%. Well, it's not just going to go back to seven. It's going to recalibrate to two or three until we pull forward demand. And so I think we're going to experience this recalibration to offset the, the pull forward demand for the next six, nine, 12 months. And then we'll start to see more normal type growth in the marketplace. 
Yeah, I would agree. And, I, and also the other thing, I suppose, that's, that's really impacting that, uh, particularly in the business that both of us in, is, is the supply chain, um, the, the cost of moving goods around, that, that, you know, regardless of where it comes from, everybody's sort of having difficulties. And, and I suppose that's going to, certainly we're seeing that, you, you, you know, you kind of think it's ba balancing out and then you get a shortage, so everybody over orders. And so looking at trends on a graph, it, it's very difficult to actually see what's happening. <laughs> on the day-to-day -day level. Final question then, um, Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would you say is an example of where you've escaped your own personal limits over the last two or three years as we've been in this, this pandemic? So many moments, so many moments. I'm not sure I knew going into the pandemic that I'd know how to navigate. Had never been through it before. I'd never been through it before. So I was really, I, I was, I was nervous. I was scared. I was worried about every single person on our payroll. Um, and the fact that we, we came through it, some casualties, right? I'm not saying no one's going to get injured as we navigate the ship through the storm, but we did it. We did it. Um, and we've been building this thing for eight and a half years. And so i um, really proud of that. Proud of myself, proud of the team, proud of our supporters. And, you know, given what we've been through, like we, 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 we I know we're going to execute on the next phase of the business. So um, just really proud of everyone and grateful mm. for the adventure. Yeah, I, we, we, the, the event was at the other week, I, that, um, one of the speakers sort of stood up and said the same. He says, look, if you're sitting in this room with a business today, um, you know, you need to stand up and pat yourselves on the back because it's you know just just to get through that and and to be here is a hell of achievement um on, on so many different levels and and it shows and most of the people in the the room were female entrepreneurs um and it you know it kind of i was extremely inspired when i sat down and talked to some of these people you know there was little small um very very small studios that had come up with with all kinds of innovative ways of bringing in money and got so creative and and i, I was just you know you just couldn't believe how much um yeah how, how much drive and 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 the ingenuity comes out of people when they're put under pressure and and i suppose being able to take that forward um you know you're, you're quite well prepared i suppose for for anything that's likely to be thrown at you <laughs> spot on so look, um, I'm very, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely uh, in admiration at what you've done. I wish I'd have, have done half at, at, at your age. Um, you're truly a, a badass and um, I'd like to thank you for, for opening up and sharing about everything that you've done and I wish you a lot of success in the future, Helene. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Matt, it's been fun. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.